بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I apologize about my voice today but uh, I'm suffering from a little bit of a flu and uh, my voice has still not recovered so I'm going to have to speak in a, a, a low voice for most of today which as you know for me is very difficult to do when I speak so will have to be a more calmer lecture inshallah I mean I mean so <coughs> Uh, we were still talking about the actual incidents during the Battle of Badr and uh, the next incident that we're going to come to is a tafsir of something in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anfal وَإِذْ زَيْنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَإِنِّي جَارُ لَكُمْ That one shaytan made their deeds beautiful to them وَإِذْ زَيْنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ وَقَالَ لَا غَالِبَ لَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ مِنَ النَّاسِ And shaytan said to them Nobody can beat you today. You are too powerful. وَإِنِّي جَارُ لَكُمْ And I am your protector. فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَ الْجَمْعَانِ When the two groups saw one another, نَكَصَ عَلَى عَقِبَيْهِ He turned around and he fled. وَقَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكَ And he said, I have nothing to do with you. إِنِّي أَرَى مَا لَا تَرَوْنَ I can see what you cannot see. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ I am scared of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. This is in Surah Al-Anfal and it is in the context of the battle of Badr. What is this a reference to? Uh, we already mentioned the first half of the story and that is that when the Quraysh were leaving Mecca, they almost turned back because they became scared of a surprise attack from another internal dispute. We mentioned this before. And shaitan came to them in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik from the Bani Kinana. And he said to them, and they were worried about an attack from one of the sub-tribes of the Bani Kinana. And he said to them, I, as the chieftain, as the nobleman from, from the Banu Kinana, are, am guaranteeing you, you're not going to get attacked from the Banu Kinana. Inni jarul lakum. You have my protection. So much so, this is Suraqa in the guise, or Shaitan in the guise of Suraqa. So much so, he said, I will even accompany you as a uh, as a live hostage if you like. I'll go with you and I'll accompany you so you can be sure that if I'm in the battle, you can. if anything happens, you can kill me. I am your literally hostage. That if anything happens, you hear of the Banu Kinana attacking, then you, you have no worry because I am a live hostage with you. لكم. So Suraqa, in the guy, obviously this is not Suraqa, this is Shaitan, is accompanying them all the way until they camp at Badr. فَلَمَّا تَرَأَتِ الْجَمْعَانِ then when the two groups met one another, or they saw, the tara'a means they saw one another. What happened? It is narrated that uh, when Suraqa saw the angels come down, and he saw Jibreel coming down on his horse, when Shaitan obviously in the guise of Suraqa saw this, he turned on his back and began running away. Now of course the Quraysh cannot see anything. To them it looks just like the army. So uh, Al-Harith ibn Hisham said, where are you running away, O Suraqa? Where are you running away? And he tried to stop him, like what's going on here? But Shaitan, in the guise of Suraqa, pushed him so severely that Al-Harith basically flew upwards and fell on his back. Clearly this is an entity that's not a human. Flew upwards and fell on his back. And then he said to Al-Harith, that as Allah says in the Quran, that I can see what you cannot see. Inni ara ma la tarun. I'm seeing what you cannot see. There's the angels on the other side. How do you expect me to fight against that? And I am scared of Allah, the Lord of the uh, worlds. And our Prophet ﷺ said, in a hadith narrated in Muatta Imam Malik, wa fi isnadihi maqal, that the Prophet ﷺ said, Shaytan was never more humiliated and more uh, despised, yani adhal, which is like, you know, dhalil. Shaitan was never more humiliated than he was on the day of Badr. So basically since Allah created him, Shaitan was never more humiliated than he was on the day of Badr because of what he saw of the blessings of Allah and the mercy of Allah and he saw Jibreel inciting the angels go forth. So Shaitan felt the lowest ever in his life on the day of Badr. And Allah mentions and references this in the Quran. And in this manifestation, in this clear example, even though we don't need it, we see here the trickery of shaitan, how he promised them. And then at the last minute, how he turned his back and literally ran away. Literally, right? And this is a, a beautiful example that Allah showed with, the, with eyes, basically. People saw this, that shaitan promises everything, right? He told them, I'll be your hostage, take me with you. 
He told them, don't worry, I'll be your protector. And then when he saw the angels come down, right at, before the battle, he turned on his back and he fled away. It is as if Allah is telling us, how can you believe him? How can you believe this liar? How can you believe this fraudster, this trickster? How can you believe this person or this entity who does not even feel ashamed to lie till the very last second? And he shows his true colors, his cowardice. Look at how scared he is now. And he actually admits, I am scared of Allah. Inni akhafullaha rabbal alameen. And also look at the significance as well of shaitan. Literally, this is Iblis himself. And we know from our texts that Iblis does not get involved except in very evil matters. Iblis is the, the, the head person. He sends his henchmen. He sends the other jinns to do his, his beckoning. Iblis, as the Prophet said, he has a throne somewhere you know, over uh, the waters. He has a throne. And he sends the shayateen to do his bidding. For Iblis to physically come to Mecca and to physically be in the army of the Quraysh, it shows his desperation. And also look at the symbolism here. And it's not just symbolism, it's real. On the one side, you have that very same entity who refused to do sajda to Adam. That very same creature, you have him. And you have Abu Jahl. And you have Utbah and Walid and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. And you have Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And literally, a hundred meters away on the other side, you have Jibreel come down from the heavens. And you have the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And you have Abu Bakr and Umar and not Uthman, because Uthman was in Mecca, as we'll come to uh, well, Medina, and Ali. You have all of the Sahaba. Wallahi, if this is not, as Allah says in the Quran, the day of decisive Furqan, Yawm al-Furqan. Allah calls Badr, Yawm al-Furqan. Furqan means sh shifting or changing or clearing the truth from the falsehood. Right? Yawm al-Furqan, the day of decision. Faraqa means to separate. Faraqa. Furqan, separation. What was separated? Truth from? Falsehood, correctness from evil. This is Yom Al-Furqan. And there's no question, look at the people on both sides. Jibreel versus Iblis himself. The Prophet Muhammad versus Abu Jahl, the Fir'aun of this Ummah. Right? And then all of the Sahaba. There is no doubt that this type of, of symbolic battle and a real battle is both symbolic and real. It has never taken place since Allah has created mankind up until the Day of Judgment. And that is why Yawm al-Badr is indeed one of the greatest victories. Uh, in fact, it is the greatest victory. Perhaps the uh, conquest of Mecca is at a similar level, but there's no doubt that the Battle of Badr is the greatest victory that was given uh, to the Prophet in terms of the actual military expeditions. And uh, when the Sahaba began uh, attacking, we had mentioned this last week that the Prophet had given them in rows, in the first row, who was in the first row, who can remind me, the very front, who was in the front? We said there were three groups. Who was in the front? No, no, no. In terms of, in terms of characteristics, or the people with spears. And then the middle, swordsmen. And then in the back, the archers, right? We have said this, that the Prophet had divided this, and I had mentioned that this was the first time in military warfare of Arabia that the Arabs had fought in ranks and rows. This is the first time. This was not of their tactics. And it is amazing that the Prophet, who was never schooled in an army school, in a military academy, he is doing what military academics have taught for hundreds and thousands of years, that army should be in rows. And this is what every military training school teaches, that there are rows. To this day, the military has his people in rows. They're marching in ranks. And Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتُنَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفًّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ Right? As if they are solidified rows and ranks. This is something that the Prophet was taught directly uh, by Allah Azza wa Jal and military commanders later on uh, have their own books for this. Now we had mentioned that the Sahaba launched the offensive. The details are not mentioned sadly. As I have said many many times, all that we have is specific incidents. What we do know is that eventually, uh, we mentioned at least 10 stories in the last, uh, uh, last Wednesday, Eventually, the Quraysh turned on their backs and they fled. The Quraysh turned on their backs and they fled and they returned back to Mecca. Now, some modern military <coughs> uh, commentators looking at the map of uh, Badr, and inshallah, maybe next Wednesday or the one after that, we'll do the map and the, the, the PowerPoint. Uh, some modern, modern military analysts, when they look at the map of Badr, <coughs> they notice that there was one clear passageway back to Mecca that the Prophet could have blocked if he wanted to, but he didn't do so. 
So it is as if the Prophet ﷺ allowed one escape passage back for them. Now this is a theory because we don't know what is in the mind of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a theory. Now why would he do this? Modern military uh, analysts, they say, this is because when a group knows that they're fighting to death, they will fight much more severe. And when there is a pressure valve outlet, what's going to happen? Their, revolve, their, their resolve will go down very fast. Right? You see the point here? That when there's no outlet, what's going to happen? There will be desperation. And when there is an outlet, then you know, well, you know what, I can always run away. So if you look at the, mili the, the layout, and I'll show you the diagram next week, inshallah, uh, next Wednesday. If you look at the layout, remember this, that there's going to be one very clear area that the Quraysh could have used to retreat. And the Prophet ﷺ, because he was on the field before the Quraysh, he could have blocked them. But he didn't do so. And that is exactly where they retreated from. And this is a very realistic theory, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows uh, the truth is very uh, plausible. The net result at the end of the battle was that 70 of the Quraysh had been killed, and around 73, 74 taken prisoners. So around 15% of the army of the Quraysh was either killed or taken prisoner of war, out of more than 1,000. 15%. And from the Muslim side, <coughs> there were no prisoners of war. There were around 15 from the Muslim side uh, killed in the battle. And this is uh, less than 5% of the Muslims were killed. So 15% of the Quraysh and their army was three times larger are killed or taken prisoner of war. And less than 5% of the Muslims, around 15 of the Muslims, less than 5% they were uh, 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 shaheed or they were martyred in the battle of uh, Badr. And when the army fled, the army of the Quraysh fled, the Prophet ﷺ regrouped the Sahaba and he said, we are going to remain here for three days. So he announced for them, we're going to remain here for three days. Why did he remain for three days? For many reasons. Firstly, to make sure that all of the Muslims, their bodies were gathered and they were given a proper janazah. They were given proper burial. Janazah here, I mean burial, not the salat al janazah. As you know, the, the shaheed is not prayed for. And by the way, this is the first time that the sharia ah of shaheed came down. What do you do for a shaheed? You don't wash his body, uh, you don't pray salat al janazah. This was when it came down that this is what you do for the shaheed, that you don't do any of this for the shaheed. Uh, also, they were not taken back to Medina. They were, even though Medina is not that far away. I mean, if you drive to Badr in our times in a car, it takes around an hour and 10 minutes. You know, it's not that far. By car, hour, 10, hour, 20 minutes, max, it'll take you. So Medina is not that far away. It's literally half a day's journey away. A day at max if they were to be slow. And yet the, the bodies were buried right there. To this day, if you go and visit Badr, I have visited Badr. You go and visit Badr, you find the graves of the Sahaba are still over there. And this shows us that the Shaheed is buried where he dies. That is the sunnah of the shaheed. Wherever he dies, you dig a grave for him. Uh, as close as possible to that place. If it's reasonable distance or whatnot, that's fine. But he is buried where he dies. We know he is buried in his clothes. He is not given another shroud. And his wounds are not even washed. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that on the day of judgment, the shaheed will be resurrected. His blood will still be the, the color of blood. But its scent will be the scent of musk. Uh, but the scent will be rihu rih al misk. That the scent will be the scent of uh, musk. Uh, he also stayed there for three days to partially recover, to recuperate, to make sure that the Quraysh did not launch a counteroffensive, and most importantly, to clarify beyond the shadow of a doubt who is the winner and who is the loser, who is the victor and who is the coward. This is very clear. You're camping at the battlefield for three days and the Quraysh don't even have the audacity, the Gauls to return back and fight. Clearly the Prophet ﷺ was the victor uh, of this uh, uh, expedition, of this battle of Badr. So the Sahaba were buried in individual graves. And there's only 15 Sahaba, so they were basically given uh, individual graves. In the battle of Uhud, when the man number was much more, two Sahabi shared a grave, as we'll get to when we get to that, right? That it was too much of a burden for them to, to, to dig uh, 75 plus graves for, the for, the, for Uhud we're talking about, right? So two people shared a grave because it was too difficult. But for Badr, because there were so few, they were given individual burials. As for the Quraysh, the bodies of the Quraysh, there's over 70 plus who died of the Quraysh, they were covered up 
in a well. They were not given the same burial as the Muslims, but they were buried by throwing the bodies into a one of the abandoned wells, right? And this shows us that in our Sharia, we show even a minimal respect to the, to the bodies of those whom the Muslim army has killed, that we don't just let them rot in the sun, that we do something to cover them up, right? We don't have to give them the same uh, funeral procedure or the same respect or the same, and this is by the way, everywhere in the world, Any your wounded and your dead are treated a million times better than theirs. This is all, everywhere in the world. This is the, the law of the land. So even in our Sharia, the, the, the Quraysh who died, they were given a different type of burial. They were, their, their bodies were simply uh, thrown into one of the empty wells so that they are covered up and then sand is thrown onto that to cover up the uh, bodies. Uh, there was only one body who could not be buried and that was, we mentioned this last Wednesday, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, right? We mentioned this last Wednesday, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, that when they found his body, and he was a fat man, he was a big man. Uh, when they found him, Rajul Samin, they say, and he, it's typical, you can imagine, the rich, and he, you know, he's coward that he was. So whatever they tried to pick him up, the flesh just literally melted. It, they didn't, it didn't allow uh, them to pick up the body. Uh, literally, the flesh just did not decompose right then and there. And so they had no other option other than to take the pebbles that he was found in. He was found in some pebbles, right? To just take some of those pebbles and then cover his body with a mound of pebbles. And as we said, there is just no question that Allah is demonstrating kama tadinu tudan as you do unto others it will be done unto you as he used to punish Bilal with pebbles and rocks and stones in that desert heat his ending will be in a sand of pebbles in a, in a mound of pebbles his ending will be that his body shall forever and ever and ever be rotting in this mound of pebbles as he used to punish Bilal so too will his fate be so that everybody knows and witnesses and there's no question this is uh, a mu'jiz or an ayah that uh, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal wanted us to uh, contemplate about. So, all of these uh, bodies were thrown into the uh, the well, and on the third day, as the Prophet was departing away from the the well. He passed by, he, di he diverted the caravan so that it would actually pass by the well. The, ca the well was not directly on the way back to Medina. But as the caravan packed up the bags, everything is, is ready to go, he diverted the caravan and the Sahaba obedient as they were, they never asked any questions about why would you do this, they simply followed along. Right, it's diverting to the right, let it be, he diverted, the, the whole caravan is following him. Then he stopped at the well where all of those bodies had been buried. All of those bodies had been buried. And he began calling them out by name, one by one. O oh, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, O oh, Walid ibn Utbah, O oh, so and so, O oh, Abu Jahl, by name. And he mentioned every one of the ru'asa, every one of the sanadid, every one of the, the leaders of the Quraysh. Oh, so and so. هَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَ رَبُّكُمْ حَقَّ Have you found what your Lord has promised you to be true? As for me, I have found the promise of Allah to be true. Have you found the promise of Allah to be true? Then he moves on to the next man, and then the next man. And so he mentioned all of the leaders of the Quraysh, one by one. And then he gave this rhetorical question. Did you find the promise of Allah true? I have found the promise of Allah true. And Umar said to him that, Ya Rasulullah, how can you speak to bodies that have no soul? How can you to uh, khatibu jasad al arwaha that you're talking to bodies that don't have any uh, cognition, they cannot hear you. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, you are not able to hear me now any better than they can. Your hearing is no better than their hearing right now. I.e., just like you can hear me, they can hear me. Right? But they cannot respond to me. But they cannot respond to me. Uh, one of the, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. One of the narrators, Qatada, and Qatada is the student of Ibn Abbas. Qatada is one of the famous tabi'un. Qatada said, Allah brought them back to life in order that they could hear the Prophet speak and in order that they could be insulted upon their injuries and humiliated and they could be a source of regret and guilt for them. So Qadada explained that Allah Azza wa Jal brought them back to life. Now, uh, we're going to pause here and go into another issue. And it is an aqadi issue, a theological issue. But it is an issue that is very relevant and people always ask about it. And this is one of the main stories that is used 
in a discussion of this theological issue, and that is the issue of can the dead in the grave hear or not? Can the dead in the grave hear or not? This is a, an issue that, uh, as I said, always people ask about if you go visit your relative, your grandmother, your uncle, if you visit a person in the grave, does the person know you are outside the grave, you are listening, or you can hear, sorry, not you are listening, but the, that, that person is listening to you. Uh, can he know that a visitor is at his grave? This is a very big theological question that even the Sahaba differed over. Even the Sahaba differed over. And this incident of Badr is one of the most important evidences used by both sides. It's an authentic evidence. Everybody knows it is there. The interpretation is the issue. Now, even the Sahaba, uh, so it is said, for example, that Ibn Umar, uh, Ibn Umar uh, would say that the uh, person in the grave can hear the one uh, uh, that visits him. And, ca and, and he even said that uh, the, the uh, person in the grave will be punished by hearing his relatives cry for him. By hearing his relatives cry, what is called niyaha al mayyit. Niyaha al mayyit means wailing over the dead. Wailing over the dead, uh, for example, to say, how am I going to live? Who's going to support me? You know, how are we going to live after this? This is wailing over the dead. And there is a hadith which is not exactly directly relevant to this, but the Prophet ﷺ said in one version of the hadith that the one in the grave will be punished when his relatives do this. And Aisha denied this and said, no. The one in the grave will not even hear them. How can he be punished? Rather, the actual hadith is that. So that's not exactly relevant to the point. The point here is that Ibn Umar affirmed that the dead can hear the wailing. Ibn Umar affirmed the dead can hear the wailing. Aisha said, no. The dead cannot hear the, uh, uh, the person outside. Did you not read in the Quran, Surah Fatir, verse 22, uh, uh, وَمَا أَنْتَ الْقُبُورِ so Aisha used something in the Quran. Wama anta bi musmi'in man fil qubur. You will not be able to make the one in the grave hear you. So Aisha denied this interpretation. Forget the issue of niyah al mayyit and and and, and ta'dib al 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 mayyit. That's not relevant now. The issue is Ibn Umar affirmed hearing. Aisha said no. This is incorrect. The dead cannot hear. Allah says in the Quran, Wama anta bi musmi'in man fil qubur. And there are other Quranic evidences as well. Surah Al-Rum, verse 52, uh, Allah says in the Quran, فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى وَلَا تُسْمِعُ الصُّمَّ الدُّعَاءَ إِذَا وَلَّوْ مُدْبِرِينَ You cannot make the mawta here. فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى Nor can you make the deaf person hear when you call out to them, especially when they turn their backs and they walk away. So in this ayah, it is as if Allah is saying, al mawta is like a sum He's comparing the, the dead person to a deaf person. Also in Surah uh, An-Naml, verse 80, Allah says, وَمَا يَسْتَوَى الْأَحْيَاءُ وَلَا الْأَمْوَاتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسْمِعُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ That Allah says in the Quran, the living and the dead are not the same. Allah can make anything He wants here, but you cannot make the dead here. وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ So that all of these ayat are used <coughs> to talk about uh, the, the, the fact that the dead cannot hear. And one can say it seems very explicit from the Quran. From the Quran, there does not appear to be any evidence to suggest that the dead can hear. Clear? The Quran seems to say very clearly that the dead cannot hear. Clear? Right? Now, let's look at the ahadith. A number of ahadith seem to suggest that the dead can hear. Hence the controversy. This is why the controversy arises. So, of the ahadith is the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That is a very long hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentions what happens to the gray, uh, what happens to the soul when it dies, and uh, the very long hadith. One phrase in it is of relevance to us that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person in the grave he hears the footsteps of those who have come to bury him as they return. <coughs> The one in the grave, when he is buried, this is at the burial. So the process is talking about what happens to the ruh, and it goes up and it goes down. The righteous goes up, the evil goes down. And then, uh, munkar and nakir, all of this. So in this, there's a phrase that the, the one in the grave will hear the people who have come to bury him. As they walk back, they, he, he, he will hear or she will hear, the, the soul will hear the footsteps on the ground as they go back to the houses, basically. Right? This hadith is in Bukhari. 
pretty clear, pretty explicit, that they will hear the footsteps going back. Another evidence that is used uh, is the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ visited Baqi' al-Gharqad, Jannatul al Baqi' as we call it, Baqi' al-Gharqad, and he said, Assalamu alaykum, ahla qawmin min al-Muslimin wal mu'minin. So he's saying, Assalamu alaykum. Why would he say Assalamu alaykum unless the people can hear, right? Assalamu alaykum to the people of the grave. Assalamu alaykum. So this is another evidence. Another evidence that is used is the mutawatir hadith, well known in every single book of hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, whoever sends salam upon me, Allah will send an angel to tell me that they have given salam. Right? Whoever sends salam upon me, an angel will come and tell me that so and so is sending salam. Uh, there is also a hadith uh, that says, and now this hadith is very explicit, whoever passes by the grave of anybody whom he knew, and says salam, the one in the grave shall recognize who said salam and he shall return his salam to him. Now, this hadith is very explicit. However, it is uh, clearly a weak hadith. It is not mentioned in the six books. It's mentioned in some of the more obscure books, Ibn Hibban and Ibn Asakir and Tariq Damish, some of the more obscure books and it is uh, very clearly a weak hadith. It's not in the famous uh, Kutub al-Sitta or Kutub al-Tis'a. Uh, had this hadith been authentic, then end of story. It's, it's very clear, but it's not authentic. Uh, of the evidences that is used is uh, the hadith of Amr ibn al-As. It's not a hadith, it's his own statement, his own wasiyyah. That he's telling his children, that when uh, he's telling him what to do after he dies, and one phrase in there says, "So when you bury me, stay at my grave for the length of time it takes to slaughter an animal and distribute the meat." Now, this phrase, "slaughter an animal, distribute the meat," is found in other hadith as well. It must have been a unit of time for them, right? I mean, they have something. They don't have 20 minutes on a watch. So this is like a phrase that they would use. For the amount of time it takes to slaughter an animal and, and, and give the meat out, I would say an expert slaughterer can do it all in half an hour. Is that, is that reasonable? Right? An expert slaughterer can you know, take a goat in half an hour, just do it and cut it up. Right? In half an hour, 25 minutes, maybe even less. I don't know. So the point being, I mean, we have a rough idea that stay at my grave for this amount of time. Half an hour, however it might be. Why? What is Amr ibn, you know Amr ibn Aus, who is he? The father of Abdullah, the famous Sahabi, the very last Sahabi who, who can remind me? Come on, I sent, went over the story of conversion. I don't understand, you guys are taking notes, it should be like, <laughs> somebody redeemed you. The last from Mecca, the last who made Hijrah, right? The last who made Hijrah is Amr ibn Aus, you guys forgot. Of those three, the last three who made Hijrah. Allah Azza blessed Amr to be of the last three who made Hijrah, right? So Amr ibn al-As, when he's about to die, he says, wait at my grave for this amount of time. Why? bikum. Your presence will calm me down. He's telling his children and his loved ones, stay at my grave, your presence will calm me down. Until once I am calm and recollected, I will be able to answer to Munkar and Nakir when they come. This is a very explicit hadith where he's basically saying, I'm going to be terrified, I'm going to be lonely and scared. Stay with me as friends and comforters for a while. <laughs> Let me calm down. Astatnis means to basically yani, get comfort from you, right? Once I am comforted, then I'll know how will I respond to the messengers from my Lord. He didn't say Munkar and Nakir, he said the messengers of my Lord, meaning Munkar and Nakir. Clear? Right? So this is a very explicit hadith that Amr ibn As thinks that the people at the grave will give him comfort. Right? This is another evidence uh, that is there. Now, uh, the, so this is the position, by the way, of uh, many of the scholars. Uh, so much so it is said that this is <coughs> the majority of the ummah. Uh, they said that the dead can hear uh, those who visit. Now obviously the dead can hear those who visit, not anybody in the world. I mean nobody said this, right? The dead according to this group, if you go visit the grave and you say salam, then the person in the grave will be aware that so and so is sending salam. 
Okay, now who said this position? This is Jumhur, really, frankly. This is the majority position. We have, I mean, I have like 10 names here. Some of them, Ibn Hazm and Nawi, Suyuti, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim as well held this position. The both of them held this position as well. Allama Shanqiti in our times, uh, this is a majority position. And Ibn Kathir, I mean, a lot of scholars, they held uh, this position. And it is clearly the majority uh, position. Now, of course, their main evidence is the incident of Badr. This is their main evidence. That's why I went into this tangent here. That the Prophet explicitly said, what did he say? They can hear me just as well as you can. You can. Right? So, this is like the most explicit evidence. And that's why I wanted to go into this because the, the incident of Badr is always used uh, to be the most important and the most explicit evidence. Okay. What is the other opinion? In response to this, other people, starting from Aisha radiallahu anha, right? So we, they have Sahaba and they have Sahaba. Both groups have Sahaba. And both groups have Tabi'un. And bro, both groups have great Imams. And by the way, this shows us that in some issues, even in Aqidah, there is difference of opinion in Sunni Islam. In some issues, there are a minority of issues, handful of issues. Even in theology, Sunnis differed. And this is one of those issues that the Sunnis themselves differed in. This is not an issue where one, one Aqidah says this, Hatta ibn Taymiyyah, is on, no, no, nothing like this, right? E even some scholars of the Athari or the Ash'ari tradition on one side and the other scholars as well on the other side. So this is not something that is a theological dispute. It is something within the Sunni madhahib. So what did the other camp say? On the other side we have Aisha, Umar ibn al-Khattab. We have uh, Qatada. We just mentioned, what did Qatada say? What did Qatada say in this very narration? That he's trying to explain how can the dead hear. So he said, Allah brought them back to life. Not that the dead can hear. But he said, Allah brought them back to life. So that they could hear. Right? Because he could not posit an opinion that says the dead can hear. So what does he say? Allah brought them back to life. This is Qatada's interpretation. This is not the Prophet This is not the Sahaba. This is Qatada. Uh, we have as well uh, the famous Al-Bayhaqi, Ibn Atiyah, Ibn Al-Jawzi, Ibn Qudama, Al-Suhayli, Al-Qadi Abu Yaal Al-Hanbali, uh, Al-Shawkani. In our times, uh, Shaykh Al-Albani has written an entire booklet on this that the dead cannot hear. And he has a lot of evidences in there. Now, how do you reinterpret all of these hadith? We just mentioned more than half a dozen hadith. What do you do? So... And, uh, and, and how do you respond to this? So, firstly, they say that the verses of the Qur'an are very explicit. Oh, I forgot to mention, how did the other camp interpret those verses? Sorry, I forgot to mention this, right? How did the first camp interpret all of those verses that says, the dead cannot hear? I forgot to mention that, right? The dead cannot hear. The Qur'an says, at least in three, four verses, the Qur'an says the dead cannot hear, right? How did the majority interpret those verses? They have a number of interpretations. Uh, the first interpretation is, the meaning of hear is not to hear just hearing, but rather a hearing that will benefit. A hearing that you will follow up to. Not just a physical hearing. And uh, they have an evidence for this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in Surah An-Naml verse 81, uh, Surah An-Naml verse 81, uh, that uh, you will only cause those to hear, uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> My mind is getting blank now. Number 81, bi ayatina wa hum muslimun. No, 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 there is no mota here. Number 81, you will only cause those to hear who believe in our signs. <laughs> we have four Hufas sitting in the audience. <laughs> They're all blanked out, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> I'm telling you the verse, number 81. I want to know it because I myself am stumped right now. He's looking up, number 81. Hmm? We have seven iPads, four iPhones, three real Mus'hafs, and we're still waiting. <laughs> Number 81. You'll get it. No, we want to have the Ummi Adal. In to smear illa man you mean to be a yatina for whom Muslimun, right? In to smear illa man you mean to be a yatina. The only people that you can make to hear are those who will believe in our signs. What is the hearing here? 
those who follow Islam. Not the hearing just to physically hear. So they have a verse in the Quran where they say, look, the hearing is a reference to hearing and following. Not just hearing with the ears. Is that clear? You understand this point, right? The second interpretation is, the dead in the Quran is not a physical death. But rather the spiritual death. In la tusmi'u al mauta, al mauta is not the one who's dead. Al mauta is the one who's a kafir. And they have evidence for this as well because Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al An'am, uh, Surah Al An'am, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that, Awa man kana maytan fa ahyayna. Give the example of the one who was dead and we gave him life. And the meaning here of death and life is. Kufr and Islam. So Allah calls the kafir mayyit. So another interpretation is, إِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى You cannot make the kafir hear you. This is another interpretation. Right? Not, has nothing to do with the mawta there. Right? Now the problem comes that, with that interpretation is that Allah very explicitly says that, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ in one ayah he says mawta, but in another ayah he says man fil qubur. And man fil qubur clearly means those who are in the grave. That's very explicit, right? So in any case, that's how they interpreted the ayat of the Quran. Okay, camp number two, a shawkani and others like him, Ibn Qudama, Al-Qatada, what did they say? They said that while it is true that mawta can refer to the kafir, in these verses, it refers to the dead because of the verse that says, Man fil qubur, as I just said. Right? That these verses, they refer to the one in the grave. As for your point of saying the Quran talks about hearing of benefit, this can be refuted through Surah Fatir verse 14. They bring another evidence from the Quran. Surah Fatir verse 14, where Allah says in the Quran, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَا اسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خَبِيرٌ Allah is talking about all of the false entities that you call out. All of the false gods. اللات, العزة, منات, Jesus Christ, Jibreel, the angels, they're calling them daughters of God, right? And they call them out. What does Allah say? When you call them, لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ They can't even hear you. وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا Even if they could hear, مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ They couldn't have the power to respond. So the reference is very clearly, they can't even hear when you call out. Only Allah is As-Sami'ah. When you say, Oh Jesus, He cannot hear you. When you say, Oh Allah, and Allah was a human being. We, we did this in Aqidah class. Allah was a human being, right? The five, go, the five false gods of Nuh were human beings, right? Uh, that, These five were human beings, right? And the Arabs would worship them up until the time of the Prophet. So Allah is saying they were human beings. But they weren't gods when they were human beings, they were gods afterward. But they were humans, they're dead. And so Allah is saying they cannot hear you when you call them out, they're in the grave. Right? The idols, not the, the idols were humans in the beginning. And the same goes for Jesus Christ. The same goes for Jesus Christ. The same goes for anything that is worshipped. It's an unconditional ayah that when you make dua to them, in tadu'uhum la yasma'u dua'akum. They cannot even hear you. Walau sami'u, even if they could hear you, mastajabu lakum. They couldn't even respond. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ And on the day of judgment, they will do kufr of your shirk. Yakfuruna bishirkikum. You did shirk, they will say we have nothing to do with this shirk that you have done. They will do kufr of your shirk. And this shows us the reference is to entities like Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus and the righteous will yakfuruna bishirkikum. Right? So that's a very explicit verse from the other uh, camp. Now another evidence that they have, how do you explain all of these ahadith? As for the incident of Badr, they say, this is the strongest evidence against you and not for you. They change the incident 180 degrees. How so? They say, Umar questioned, how could these people hear when they're dead? The Prophet did not correct him and say, Ya Umar, the dead can hear. What are you talking about? Rather, he made an exceptional case. Oh Umar, 
innahumul an right now this group can hear me just as well as you can an exception in time and in place and in people and he didn't say oh umar why are you asking such a question don't you know the dead can hear you see the difference between the two responses right he made a very clear exception that they are hearing me right now just as well as you can Right? And this clearly shows that Umar understood the Quran correctly. And now he's questioning how can you speak? And the Prophet is not correcting that misunderstanding because it is not a misunderstanding. It's a correct understanding. And the Prophet is simply saying this is a miracle, basically. Special time and place. How about the other evidences? The issue of the footsteps. The dead can, can hear the one in the burial going back. Once again, the Prophet is making an exceptional time and place. <laughs> that this is not any person who visits him. This is at the time of burial. And we know in authentic ahadith that the ruh will come back to the grave right now for Munkar and Nakir. Right? The ruh will come and re be reunited with the body in the Alam al Barzakh to respond to Munkir and Nakir. So the Prophet is basically telling us at that point in time, the footsteps of those who walk back, those footsteps on the top of the ground, they will be heard by the one in the grave. Not conversations, not hello, hi, how are you doing? Rather, just the reverberations from the top of the grave for that period of time when the soul is reunited with the body. Once again, there is a clear exceptional clause that makes logical uh, sense. As, <coughs> as for the issue, of the Prophet I'm going to Baqi' and saying Assalamu Alaikum Ahla Qawmi Minal Muslim Minal Mu'mineen Yes, he did say Assalamu Alaikum But this is the Salam of Dua and not the Salam of Tahiyyah i.e. this is a Dua he's making for the dead and not a greeting of Assalamu Alaikum because Assalamu Alaikum literally means may Allah's peace be upon you So he is saying Assalamu Alaikum and he means it He's making Dua for them where did you get that the dead can hear from this? There's no evidence at all. That he is saying, may Allah's peace be on you, O people of the grave. And there's no evidence here that the dead can hear. And that's actually very valid. That from this hadith, you don't get anything about the dead hearing. As for the... Uh, yeah, but there's no, there's, no, there's no evidence of hearing is my point. As for the hadith of uh, the dead person recognizing the one who says salam to him, we said this is weak. And pretty much every scholar of hadith who studies hadith says it is uh, weak. As for Amr ibn al-As and his wasiyya to his children, we say this is his interpretation. The Prophet did not tell him to do it. And some of the Sahaba, Aisha and Umar, are authentically reported to have denied the dead can hear. So this is, seems to be from the Sahaba's time. As for the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that the angels come and give him salams, once again this is a very explicit evidence against and not for. Because if the Prophet ﷺ could hear directly, he wouldn't need the angels to go tell him. The very fact that an angel has to convey the salam indicates what? He cannot hear. And Allah is telling an angel to go convey the salam. And by the way, this is a common misunderstanding. It doesn't matter whether you're in front of the grave or whether you are in America. The angel will go and to give him the salam. Visiting to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, of course, it's an emotional experience. It's an iman builder, of course. But in terms of how your salam will get to him, it's all going to be from the angels, right? How your salam will get to him. So, you being in front of the grave versus you being in America, the angel will go and tell him. Therefore, if even the Prophet requires an angel, what does this show about? The salam that can be heard, it cannot be heard. Therefore, in my humble opinion, one of the few things I would disagree with Ibn Taymiyyah about, in my humble opinion, it does seem to be that the dead cannot hear. And Allah knows best, we, could, we shouldn't be too strict about this issue because some of the Sahaba had the other opinion. And it is true to say that many scholars held a position that the dead can hear the one who visits them. Many scholars held this position, right? So the main point that we need to emphasize before moving on, this is a theoretical issue. As they say, no action is derived from this. It's a theoretical issue. 
By unanimous consensus, you don't go to the grave and start having a conversation or start asking the dead for your needs, which is shirk. Right? Or, yani, such jahala you see sometimes in the Muslim world when somebody is buried, somebody is going to stand there and say, Oh, so and so, Munkar and Nakir are going to come. Make sure you say that Allah is your Lord. Now you pause for a melodramatic effect. Now say that the Prophet is your Prophet. Then you pause again. Now say that you know, this is jahala. Wallahi, it's complete stupidity. Who are you to answer on his behalf? I mean, do you really think he needs you to be telling him? And they call this talqeen, talqeen al mayyit, right? In many cultures and societies, you, you will have this talqeen al mayyit, right? And wallahi, I mean, you just, I mean, you just wonder how foolish people are. You really think that at this point in time, he can cheat on his exam, right? Because that's what's happening, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to cheat on your exam that somebody's shouting the answer for you and just because you're shouting, you're going to give the answer. And he, you really wonder at the mentality of these people. So, my, what I'm trying to say is, even if you say that the dead can hear in the grave, there's no action that will come from that. There's no action that will come from that. That's just a theoretical issue. And the evidences are, frankly, uh, strong on both sides. Nonetheless, from this incident of Badr, we'll get back to the incident of Badr, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? That, I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, O Umar, they can hear me right now just as well as you can. Honestly, what do you learn from this or what do you glean from this except that this is an exception? Wallahi, this is what comes to my mind. You know, this is an exception for these people that Umar himself was amazed and the Prophet ﷺ did not correct his amazement. Rather, he simply said, they can hear me at this time just as well as uh, you can. In any case, that's uh, an issue of uh, aqidah. I wanted to go into that tangent. Now we get back to the issue of uh, the incident of Badr. Now, Another thing that took place in these three days before the Prophet ﷺ returned, so he still camped at the Battle of Badr. <coughs> the next uh, incident that occurred was the issue of the spoils of war. What is to be done with all of this is called Ghanima. Because they've never actually been in a battle before where they captured Ghanima. They've never actually caught Ghanima before. And we know for a fact from the Quran and Sunnah that the previous ummas were not allowed to keep Ghanima. The previous ummas, they had to give it up. The Bani Israel and the people before them, Allah has not made uh, war Ghanima halal for any ummah except for our ummah. That before this, as we know, um, and by the way, this is mentioned in the Old Testament as well, that when they captured the uh, the, the, the items from war and whatnot, they would make a big pile. They would make a big pile. This is in the Old Testament. And the, Quran, the Hadith affirms this. And Allah Azza wa Jal would send a, uh, th uh, uh, a lightning, would send a thunderbolt, and burn this up in front of them to show that it has been accepted. That in front of them, all of this money and wealth would be destroyed in front of them as a sign that Allah has accepted it from them. So when the Muslims uh, finished the battle of Badr, they had a lot of ghanima, they had a lot of spoils of war. And they began to wonder what exactly to do with it. And some discussion broke up amongst the Sahaba. Some discussion broke up. And that is because the Sahaba in the course of the battle had split up into a number of groups. And each group was claiming some privilege over the other group. So one group said that we were the ones who collected the booty from the battlefield. We have the share of it. We should get it. We were the ones who went and collected it, and so we should get it. Another group said we were the ones who were pursuing the Quraysh as they ran away to make sure they wouldn't come back. And had we not been pursuing, you couldn't have collected so we protected you. The third, a third group said, we were surrounding the Prophet ﷺ as precaution that they wouldn't attack. And the only reason we stayed next to him was to protect him. So how could you deprive us? Rather, we deserve it as well. And so, and this was not a fight, this was not a debate, but rather, this was a discussion breaking out who is going to get the, uh, the, uh, the war booty. And uh, it is said that, 
one of the Sahaba, uh, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, he came with a beautiful sword that he had captured from, uh, from uh, the person that he had killed. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, uh, give this sword to me. It wasn't his, it was the one that he killed. Give this sword to me for, by Allah, I used it in the battle. So he got rid of his sword, he used that. I used it in the battle, so give it to me. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, <coughs> This is the first ayah of Surah Al-Anfal. And so Surah Al-Anfal is revealed literally on the battlefield. Literally. And inshallah, I'm still serious. Inshallah, maybe not next week, but the weekend after that or the next Wednesday, we will go over, inshallah, maybe even the whole Surah Al-Anfal. I'm still serious about this, right? It's a bit of a tangent, but I, we really want to connect the Quran with the Seerah. I really want to make sure that we have a... And a Surah Al-Anfal is not a small surah, but it's not a long surah. It's around eight, nine pages. Uh, and uh, it's basically the every single ayah is directly linked to Badr. I mean, literally, every single ayah is linked to Badr. So I think it's a very good summary that we go over quickly all of Anfal. And I'm uh, serious about that, inshaAllah ta'ala. So this is the first verse of Anfal. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَلِ anfal. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Ya Rasulullah, I want this. Give it to me. Tell them the general rule. This is not your property. This is the property of Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger. And we can do with it or Allah can do with it as He uh, pleases. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is reminding them that they should not allow greed to become their primary incentive. That don't break up your brotherhood. That Allah's pleasure is more important than this money. Then the Quran goes on and then explains that yes indeed the war booty can be distributed and the <coughs> the details or the fiqh of distribution is beyond the scope of, uh, of, of this but yani, every book of fiqh has chapters of, about this issue. Uh, but in a nutshell in a nutshell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that one-fifth وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ مَا غَنِمْتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ وَلِلرَّسُولِ one fifth of it is put aside. This one fifth is itself divided into five. This one fifth is itself divided into five shares, right? Number sh share number one. وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ مَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَأَنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسُهُ وَلِلرَّسُولِ لِلَّهِ وَلِلرَّسُولِ is considered one. So that is one fifth of one fifth. That is zero point zero four. No, one fifth of one fifth is not in tenth yard. That's why, I mean, <laughs> that's why that's why you're a doctor and not an accountant. Okay. <laughs> it is it is four percent, right? Four percent. So four percent goes to the Prophet And this was unique for him in his life. After his death, then obviously this is not there. So four percent goes to him. Number two, what is al qurba? This is for Al al bayt of the Prophet. ﷺ. And this is Khumus al Khumus. Again, one fifth of one fifth. So another four percent. Right? And this is in Sunni fiqh. We respect the Al al bayt. And we even give them Khumus al Khumus. By the way, the Shia, the, the Khumus, this is where they get it from, the Khumus. That the Khumus, they say they have a different fiqh than us. And their Khumus is different than their Zakah. For us, Khumus is only in Ghanima. Khumus al Khumus is only in Ghanima and it is for Al al Bayt. And the Al al Bayt, who they are, is again a question of Sunni and Shia difference as well. For us, Al al Bayt is broader than those whom the Shia say is Al al Bayt. That's another difference. But we respect the Al al Bayt and we give them this Khumus al Khumus. To this day, if this occurred and those who were in uh, uh, the area that we are in, we will give them Khumus al Khumus. So that is the second of the five Khumus al Khumus. What's the third one? Waliyatama, <laughs> orphans. 4% goes to the orphans. What's the f next one? Masakin, poor people. 4% goes to poor people of the community. Wabnis Sabil, travelers and wayfarers who don't have any money. So 4% goes to them. These 4, 4, 4, 4, 4%, 4 this gives you a total of 20%. Correct? The rest of the 80% is given back to the army. And in the Battle of Badr, Every single person was given an equal share. <coughs> this was early Islam. <coughs> Every single person was given an equal share. Later on in the battle of Khaybar onwards, the Prophet ﷺ changed this. And he gave the one with an animal 
three times the amount that the one who didn't have an animal. The infantry was not the same as the cavalry. Right? The one who had a horse or a camel got three times the amount of the one who didn't have a horse and a camel. Uh, this was later on changed in the in the Khaybar and onwards. But right now for Badr, everybody was given an equal amount. And there were nine people who were given an amount even though they were not on the battlefield. Every one of them had a legitimate excuse. The most important for us, the one that we'll discuss is Uthman ibn Affan. Right? Uthman got a share. The same amount as all of the other Badriyun. And he's considered a Badri, even though he didn't participate in Badr. Why? Because Ruqayya, his wife and the daughter of the Prophet wasallam, had fallen severely sick. In fact, they didn't know this, but she was going to die. And so, Uthman wanted to go. But the Prophet wasallam, told him to take care of Ruqayya. So he remained behind and We'll come to the story later on. She passed away the day that the Prophet ﷺ returned back from Badr. That she was buried on the same day. That uh, he returned back later on, she was buried earlier on in the day. So Uthman stayed behind and he was given a share of the, uh, of the uh, booty as well. Uh, another issue that took place in those three days, so we're still talking about again those three days, two major incidents happened. The first is the issue well, well the issue of the, the talking to the people, I said that already. Uh, the other issue is about the, the, the booty. Uh, the third issue, which is of significance, is about the prisoners of war, the POWs. This is another big issue. The POWs, the prisoners of war. What exactly is to be done with these uh, prisoners of war? What exactly is to be done with the 73 or 74 of the uh, Usara that were captured in Badr? Once again, this is the first time they've taken prisoners. They've never done this before. And they don't know what is to be done. And in Sahih Bukhari we learn <coughs> that the Prophet ﷺ surveyed all of these prisoners in front of him. 70 plus, all of them were in front of him. And he said, لَوْ كَانَ مُطْعِمْ إِبْنْ عَدِي حَيًّا ثُمَّ كَلَّمَنِي فِي هَؤُلَا إِنَّتْنَا لَأَطْلَقْتُهُ لَهُمْ If Mut'im ibn Adi were alive right now, Mut'im ibn Adi had just died a few months before Badr. Mut'im ibn Adi is a recent death, fresh death. If Mut'im ibn Adi had been alive right now, and he spoke to me to free all of these Natna means it's filthy, filthy, dirty, because they just tried to kill us. I mean, you know, the, he spoke to me about all of these people. I would have freed them all for him. Now they're about to collect a fortune from this 73 people. Literally in our times it will be estimated in the millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And he says, if Mut'im just uttered one word, I would return all of these people to him. For free. Now this is, in my opinion, a very significant phrase that has profound implications for us, especially here in the Western world. Question arises, why? Why would he say this? What has this phrase got to do? And why would you utter a word when Mut'im has died? Mut'im is not a Muslim. Mut'im was not a Muslim. Why would he utter this, this phrase? So Mut'im ibn Adi, if you remember, we mentioned his name many times in the seerah. And Mut'im has done multiple tasks throughout the Meccan era to help Islam and the Muslims. Mut'im was one of those who fed the people when they were boycotted. Mut'im was one of those who stood up and wanted to break the boycott. And perhaps most importantly, perhaps the number one thing that Mut'im did was that when Abu Lahab, his own uncle, said, you are no longer Qurashi, you can no longer stay in Mecca, right? When Abu Lahab himself said, you can't be here. And the Prophet ﷺ returned from Ta'if and he camped outside Mecca for three days. And Bilal is negotiating because he can't return to Mecca. Abu Lahab has revoked his citizenship basically, right? Abu Lahab has revoked his visa. You cannot come in. I am not giving you permission to come in. And so he sends Bilal to Suhail ibn Amr. He sends Bilal to Walid. He sends Bilal to four or five people. Every one of them gives an excuse. Sorry, you know what? No, this and that. I'm not that powerful. Mut'im, when he hears this, what does he do? He sends his own sons. He arms his own sons and he sends his own sons outside to escort the Prophet back into Mecca, right? And 
he commands the Prophet to do tawaf, escorted with his own sons, and then he stands up in public and he says, I have protected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anybody who harms him has harmed me. Even Abu Lahab had to bow his head down and say, we will protect those whom you have protected. His own uncle refused. Mut'im stood up. And so, what is the Prophet doing with this phrase right now? He is repaying the favor in kind. He is giving a kafir mushrik pagan what is due to him. And this shows us over and over again, and alhamdulillah, by now people, alhamdulillah in America have lost this mentality, but wallahi 10 years ago we had it, and many people still have it, across the globe they have it, that they think, yani even now, wallahi even now they think you're not allowed to vote, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, the mentality is just so backward, you want to scream, scream with frustration, and yani how people, you know, that you cannot, cooperate with the kuffar and the kuffar this and the kuffar I mean they're living in some other you know utopia or some other you know mentality I think in this uh, incident what do we learn that the Prophet respected the highest honor that he is saying one word from mut'im and all of these will be handed back to him this is like the medal of honor this is like the 21 gun salute. This is like the, 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 the purple star, the heart. This is like, how else are you giving the honor due? The guy is dead, he's not even going to hear this hadith, right? But there's a legacy, there's an honor. He helped us out, we have to repay that help. And we learn here that there are those who are not Muslims, but they have good hearts. Yes, this is true to say. They don't have good hearts in Tawheed, okay, they are shirk. But they have good hearts in in, in, sorry, in, in mercy, in humanity, in tribalism, in standing for truth. This is what it is. That Mut'im did not approve of Islam as a religion, but he did not approve of the zulm of the Quraysh against the Muslims. And so the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of this. And he appreciated it, and he repaid him back in kind. In our times, there are those non-Muslims who don't agree with Islam theologically. Okay, but they want to stand for truth. They want to stand for freedom. They don't want these Islamophobes. They don't want the hatred. They don't want... So it is our job to honor them, to respect them, to reach out to them, to work together for a better society, as the Prophet ﷺ did. This is exact, I mean, it's so crystal clear that it is amazing that people, again, they, they, they have a selective reading of the seerah. There is no question that there are those who want to stand for truth and justice, even if they don't have the same belief as you. And to honor them, to respect them, to cooperate with them, to be with them, our Prophet ﷺ did it even in death. Mut'im is dead, and he's still uh, giving this praise to Mut'im ibn Adi. So he says this about the... Uh, about the uh, the prisoners of war, that Lokana Mutim ibn Adi Hayyan, if Mutim were alive and he spoke to me about these people, then I would have given it, uh, uh, it uh, would have given all of them uh, back to him. Now the issue came, what is to be done with the prisoners of war? And this was a very traumatic issue. Because on the one hand, these very people have just tried to kill them. Literally, it's been not only a few hours. In the morning, they've tried to kill him. Now they're prisoners of war in the afternoon. What is to be done? So the Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba, what do you think? And in particular, he asked his two wazirs, wazirai, wazirayu Rasulullah Wasallam. Ali ibn Abi Talib called Abu Bakr and Umar wazirayu Rasulullah. Abu Ali said this, that these two were the wazirs of the Prophet ﷺ. So he asked his two wazirs, Abu Bakr and Umar, what is to be done? And so Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are our relatives, they are our blood, they are our kith and kin. So show mercy to them. For the sake of, 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 of brotherhood, for the sake of, of you know, uh, our own tribe, show mercy to them. After all, they're the same family as us, the Quraysh, right? And Umar ibn al-Khattab, you know him and who he is. He said, as for me, Ya Rasulullah, I think that you should give Aqil from the Banu Hashim to Ali and he'll cut his head off. And give me somebody from the Banu al-Khattab and I will do the job here. So we don't leave any of them. They tried to kill us, we should do the same to them. Why should we send them back so they're going to come and attack us another day? And so the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes some hearts so soft, they are softer than milk. And others he makes them so hard, they are harder than stones. As for you, o o Abu Bakr, 
you have a resemblance of Ibrahim and Isa. When Ibrahim said to his to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when Ibrahim said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that فَمَن تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي وَمَن عَصَانِي فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If they follow me, they are of me. <clears throat> and if they disobey me, then O oh Allah, you are forgiving and merciful. And Isa alayhi salam, he says in the Quran, إِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُكْ وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ If you punish them, then they are your servants. But if you forgive, then you are Aziz and Hakim. So Abu Bakr, you are like Ibrahim and you are like Isa. And O oh Umar, you are like Nuh and you are like Musa. Right? Nuh, what does he say? رَبِّ لَا تَذَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارًا Don't leave a single house of kafirs on earth. Not one. And Musa says that, O oh Allah, أُشْدُدْ عَلَى قَلْبِهِمْ That make their hearts hard. And فَلَا يُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى يَرَوْا الْعَذَابَ الْأَلِيمِ Make sure they never have iman until they see the very punishment come down on them. Right? So, O oh Umar, you are like Musa in this regard. And the Prophet ﷺ agreed to the suggestion of Abu Bakr. He agreed to the suggestion of Abu Bakr. And uh, the next day, Umar ibn Khattab is narrating the hadith, the next day he found, so this is the, the second of those three days, right? He found the Prophet ﷺ crying under a tree with Abu Bakr. The Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr crying under a tree. And so Umar said, what is causing you to cry, O Messenger of Allah? For by Allah, if I understand, then I will cry with you. And if I don't understand, I'll force myself to cry just to be with you. And yani just to be a part of this group. Whatever it is, I'll cry. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ recited to him those verses of Surah Al-Anfal. The Prophet ﷺ recited to him those verses of Surah Al-Anfal in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that uh, it is not permitted or it is not not permitted is a harsh word. It is not good or it is not desirable uh, for a messenger, for a prophet to have prisoners of war until he establishes power. Right now you're still weak. You shouldn't have had prisoners and then release them or ransom them off until you have established yourself in the land. Allah mentioned one of the reasons that some of the Sahaba wanted to ransom. Not Abu Bakr, some of the Sahaba. That you wanted the money. You wanted the ransom. That was your main motivation. Wallahu yuridu al akhirah. But Allah wants something bigger than this, better than this, and that is the akhirah. And then Allah says that were it not for the fact that Allah had already decreed this for you, or Allah Azza wa had already allowed this to happen, an adab would have come and taken you. A punishment would have come and seized you. And so this is what caused the Prophet to uh, cry and to uh, uh, feel so sad about this. Now of course, later on, later on, the Sharia ah came down to give the Khalifa the choices of what to do, right? And so this, this ruling is now no longer of course valid. Of course the Khalifa, if there is ever a Khalifa and this happens, there are a number of options that are allowed to be done. In this time for the Battle of Badr, Allah Azza wa Jal said it wasn't the best decision, but now that you have done it, then let it go. And this leads us to a very deep theological and usul al-fiqh issue, which we don't really have the time to discuss in a lot of detail, but one of our brethren was insisting that we uh, talk about this in some detail. So just a few minutes on this and not too much because it is not the place for this topic. And that is the issue of uh, does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have independent ijtihad? That is he able to exercise his own opinion? Or does everything he say emanate directly from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? This is an issue that the scholars of Usul al-Fiqh especially have been discussing from the earliest of times. Uh, and. There are obviously, as usual, more than two opinions, but there's two primary opinions. The first of them, and this is the minority opinion, by the way, is that everything the Prophet ﷺ says is directly wahi. And they mention in the Quran, uh, that everything he says is wahi that comes to him. This is the minority opinion. The vast majority of Sunni scholars, now of course the Mu'tazila have other positions, the mass majority of Sunni scholars, they said that 
it is very clear and explicit that the Prophet wasallam, Allah gave him the right to do ijtihad. And he did ijtihad and Allah Azza wa Jal would sometimes correct this ijtihad and sometimes let it pass. And in both cases, his ijtihad was binding for the Sahaba to follow. So the key point which has to be very clearly mentioned, whatever the Prophet ﷺ commanded, the Sahaba had to follow. Regardless of whether you say it came from Allah or it came from Him, unanimous consensus, all the scholars agree, whatever He commands you to do, you must follow it. However, it is in my humble opinion very clear, and this is the majority opinion, that Allah gave our Prophet ﷺ the right to do ijtihad. And sometimes he was correct, and so Allah let it pass. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed it, or even the Prophet ﷺ himself uh, changed it. And there are many examples of this. Now, as for the verse in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنْ يُوحَى Even by the context, it is very clear, this is a reference to the Quran. عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَى ذُو مِرَّةٍ فَاسْتَوَى وَإِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي لُوحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ It's very clear that the context is about the Quran directly. It is very clear that the Prophet ﷺ was a human being, we all agree to this, that for 40 years before the Wahi, he spoke as a human, that even after the Wahi began, he still remained a human being, he said in an authentic hadith, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرْ أَنْسَا كَمَا تَنْسَوْنَ I am a human being, I forget as you forget. In one hadith, he said that I get angry sometimes. I get angry sometimes. And uh, we'll go on and mention some examples of this, but so he mentions certain things that he is showing his own humanity, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it is very clear that at times, he can make an ijtihad regarding an issue and this issue later on is correct or, or he himself corrects it. Of them, we are, the example is given of the incident of Badr where he made ijtihad. And this is not a purely secular matter. This is a semi-religious, semi-secular matter. It's a little bit of a both issue. What is to be done? And he made ijtihad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told him this wasn't the best ijtihad to do. Uh, also the issue of the example of cross-pollination. The hadith is in Bukhari where he passed by uh, farmers doing a type of cross-pollination. He said, why are you doing this? So they said, well, it works better. So he said, why don't you try not doing it? They didn't do it and obviously it wasn't pollinated. So then he himself said that if I give you something of um, uh, of Umur al-Din, then I am Rasulullah. If I give you something of Umur al-Dunyakum, fa'antum a'lamu bi Umur al-Dunyakum. You know your worldly affairs better than I do. And this clearly shows he is speaking from his own ijtihad. He is speaking from his own ijtihad, even if it is in something secular, he is speaking from his own ijtihad. However, even in matters of sharia, sometimes it appears that he was making his own ijtihad and Allah gave him the right to do that. So for example, the issue of prohibiting going to the graves. He himself said later on, I used to forbid you from visiting graves, but now go ahead and visit them. And there does not seem to be any wahi from Allah to change this. Rather, it seems that he himself felt that this is now okay to go visit graves. Another example which is even more explicit. He said, I, I was about to forbid you al-ghila. And al-ghila means uh, being intimate with your wife when she is uh, feeding the child. Uh, basically for that year or so after delivery, uh, uh, to be intimate with your sp spouse during this time of after delivery, when the child is being breastfed. So he said, I was about to forbid you to do this, but then I saw the Romans and Persians do this and it doesn't affect their child, so therefore go ahead and do it. Now this clearly shows that he, this is his ijtihad. And had he forbidden this, well, I would be in trouble, number one. But number two, had he forbidden this, we would have been obliged to follow. Correct? We would have been obliged to follow. So it's something that quite clearly our Prophet ﷺ had ijtihad, and he was exercising it, but he looked around and he said, you know what? No, it's all right. You can do it. Also, he said, uh, for the issue of the hypocrites of Tabuk, he forgave them, and Allah revealed in Surat uh, at tawbah Allah revealed in Surat Tawbah, عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكَ لِمَ أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ why did you give them permission? Allah has forgiven you though, but you shouldn't have done that. 
So in Tabuk as well, he made an ijtihad and Allah said, why did you do that? But it's all right, Allah has forgiven you for doing this. And uh, he himself changed his mind for a number of rulings, which are again, as I said, very clear that he had ijtihad and he, uh, uh, and he uh, changed it. For example, uh, Hadith of Fatiba bint Qais. She was a, a young lady that many people were interested in marrying her. Her husband died a shaheed, so the pro and she didn't have a house to live. So the Prophet said, go to Umm Shuraik's house, uh, wait until your idda finishes, then I'll see who you should marry. Uh, then he sent her a message that, you know what, uh, Umm Shuraik, a lot of men visit her because she was an elderly lady and she would have uh, maybe a, uh, every few days she would have a feast or something. We don't know the whole stories, but a lot of my Sahaba visitor of the young Ansar, don't go, don't be in her house because maybe they'll see you when they shouldn't see you. Go to your cousin Ibn Umm Maktoum, he's your cousin, he's blind, you can live in one of his rooms, so go there. Clearly he's changing his mind. First go there, first go there. Nothing wrong with this, he's a human being. Also we have for example the issue of uh, uh, Hajj, when he went for Hajj. The, the only hajj he did. The Prophet ﷺ, what type of hajj did he do? Who can remind me? What type of hajj did you do? Danish, I'll put you on the spot. What type of hajj did he do? Qiran. Qiran, very good. He did Qiran. What did he say? In hajj Qiran, لَوَ اسْتَقْبَلْتُ مِنْ أَمْرِ If I knew now what I knew, uh, what I knew when I began the hajj, I wouldn't have done Qiran. And I would have done basically tamattu, basically. I mean, he didn't use the words, but if I knew now what I knew back then, I wouldn't have done this, I would have done that. And this is clearly religion, and it's clearly he's talking about his own change of heart, change of uh, ijtihad. It's not sharia, but it's clearly his own ijtihad. And I've given you other examples of sharia. Again, we don't want to go into this whole discussion. I've told you this is the vast majority opinion, and the evidences are on and on and on. Um, also, the, uh, the issue of uh, matters even of, of aqidah a little bit, where for example in the incident of Uhud, in the incident of Uhud, when the people hit him and the blood started coming down, he said, how can Allah ever forgive you? How can Allah ever forgive you? And what did Allah, Allah reveal in the Qur'an? What did Allah reveal in the Qur'an? Ya Hufad. Ya Hufad, what did Allah reveal in the Qur'an? Laysa laka min al-amri shay. This is a very strict verse, very strong verse. You have no right to say this. Nothing. Whether Allah forgives or punishes, this is not yours to say. They have done zulm, but you don't have the right to forgive or to punish. This is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is right to do so. Also, the, is, he made a dua about Muawiyah, which I don't want to get into now, it's going to be a bit, bit too long, but yani, clearly, even when he was told, did you say this about Muawiyah, he, he made an explanation for that, not, I didn't mean it at face value, don't take it in that manner. Uh, a very explicit shari'i ruling, Mutawatir, Bukhari and Muslim, that when he conquered Mecca, he said, every single tree in Mecca is haram. Nobody should pluck a leaf from Mecca. It's all haram. Right then and there, what did his uncle say? Illa al-idhkhir ya Rasulullah. Allow me to pluck the idhkhir because we use it for spice, for this or that. So what did the Prophet say? Okay, illa al-idhkhir. What does this show? I mean, wallahi, you are very clear. It is, to me, this is an honor that Allah gave to the Prophet You have the right to do the shari'ah. Rather than flipping around, somebody said this is disrespectful, it's the exact opposite. For our Prophet ﷺ, Sam'an wa ta'a. He's human, but he's Rasulullah. So he is allowed to write that in there say, Illa al-idhkhir. Okay, idhkhir. So to this day, every book of fiqh says, you cannot pluck any leaf in Makkah except for idhkhir. To this day. Why? Because Abbas begged him for an exception. He gave his uncle the exception, and the whole ummah has that exception. Illa al idhkhir Rasulullah. Okay, fine. Illa al idhkhir. And again, on and on. I mean, we can go on and on and on. We don't. The time is up here. My point being, the brother wanted to uh, go into a little bit of a discussion in this. So there are literally no exaggeration. Fifty or more examples of the ishtihadat of the Prophet sallallahu Some of them secular. Some of them somewhat secular religious. Some of them purely religious. Some of them even theological. Clearly shows us he is bashar. He is human being. But Allah made obedience to him obligatory. So whatever he says, we must obey.
Sam'an wa ta'a. Whatever he says about the sharia, about the matters of this uh, uh, of our religion, we are obliged to obey. And if he makes an exception, if he makes this, if he does that, this is completely permitted for him to do. And it is our obligation to hear and to obey. Inshallah, in our next Wednesday, we'll continue talking about uh, the issue of the, the prisoners of war. We haven't quite finished, so let's leave the questions uh, and answers about the prisoners to the next class. But if there are questions and answer about the issues before that, inshallah. Yes, bismillah. Uh, I have a question about the way you mentioned, John, that you know, uh, nobody came here today, and you mentioned the story about the Hadith of Islam. So when he will come back, how he will he know about all the incidents after his demise took his life? How will he have the knowledge of the all the incidents? How will he have the knowledge of which incidents? About any of the how we have said that he will come as a Muslim. But he has, he's not dead though, he's alive. So, so, but you're saying that in this, uh, in this ayah, Allah Ta'ala is also saying that he cannot hear. You're implying that, you know, when... Well, that's very clear that Isa cannot hear those who call him. That's very clear that Isa cannot hear those who call him. I, I don't understand the question then. Well, Are you saying that Isa can hear? Well, you, you brought it, like he was dead. Oh, yeah. That he cannot hear or hear? <laughs> no, Isa cannot hear. So then how will he have the knowledge of something? Of all of what? The people who call out to him? Coming back. All the events. All the people who are Coming back? Allah told him he has to come back. No, but... The life in between. No. What does he need to know about the life in between? Whatever he needs to know, Allah will tell him. Allah will ask him, did you tell people to worship me? This is in the Quran. No, the life on earth, when he comes to earth, how would he have the knowledge of what is happening? But he is Rasul. Allah will tell him what he needs to know. And I mean, when he's going to come back, histories will still be here, people will still be here. They will tell him what, whatever he needs to know. I mean, I don't see this as being ilm al-ghayb that... I mean, I don't see this as being a problematic. What he needs to know, either Allah will tell him, or the people will tell him, the Mahdi will tell him, the Muslims around him will tell him that this and this is happening. I don't see this as being an issue of hearing uh, of the dead. Plus, Isa is not technically dead right now, right? Questions before we conclude? Yes. Is there any other incident than Prophet uh, the talked to the, uh, like, the people in the cover, like No. Is there any other incident? No. The only time, that's why the incident of Badr is the most explicit evidence. The incident of Baqi' is not explicit. Because it's just Salam. The incident of Badr, that's why I went into the tangent that that is the main incident that is used. That he literally spoke to the dead. And the point is the Sahaba did not understand this. Umar said publicly, how could you do that? Even none of the other Sahaba said, oh Umar, don't you know the dead can hear? So it's as if all of the Sahaba tacitly wanted this question. Umar was the brave one to ask it, that how could you be speaking to the dead? There is no other instance in the entire seerah that the Prophet speaks to a, uh, a dead person. Sisters, any questions? Brothers, yes, go ahead. How does that uh, relate to reciting the Quran and the so there's two issues. Number one, reciting Quran for the dead. Number two, reciting Quran at the grave. As for reciting Quran for the dead, as I have said many, many, many times, the vast majority of scholars have allowed this. They have allowed it to recite Quran for the dead. To gift ihda' al-thawab al mayyit To gift it to the dead. Uh, even Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, they all allow this. Hatta Shaykh Ibn Baz, they all allow this. Uh, and it is a minority opinion that has said it is not allowed. As for going to the grave and reciting Quran, there is nothing that has been narrated from the Prophet ﷺ in this regard. And we have authentic hadith prohibiting salah in the grave. So, honestly, the least that can be said is should be avoided. The least that can be said should be avoided. However, in some books, and I haven't looked at the Asanid, it is mentioned that uh, Ibn Umar gave the wasiyah that uh, the last verse of Baqarah should be recited when he's buried. Khawatim Baqarah. And based on this, some of the madhahib have said that you recite the Quran at the grave. So they extrapolated even from this incident of Ibn Umar. So, no doubt, yani, whoever does it, there is some basis for it from Ibn, Mas uh, Ibn Umar. 
And whoever avoids it, I think they're being closer to the Sunnah. Does that relate to Ibn Umar's position that uh, they Obviously. Yes, this is <laughs> the, the whole, it's connected, right? The theological position there. Right. Yes. So if we believe that the, the Prophet yes. allowed it to have, and we also believe that um, there are all these examples where, that show that, and sometimes he erred in his jihad. Is there a difference in the way uh, ulama today view the jihad versus what's already commanded in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, uh, inshallah, I'll make this point clear in the next Wednesday lesson as well. But I, I, I said this very explicitly in today's lecture. All Sunni scholars believe that the fact that the ijtihad was allowed to stand means Allah approved it. So it is direct approval. The only uh, time that wahi will come down is to correct it. Which means if it's not corrected, it is correct. Right? So this is very explicit that every ijtihad of the Prophet is binding. The Quran is very clear in the Quran. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا Only by obeying him shall you be guided. Right? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Every prophet we have sent, we have sent so that he be obeyed by the permission and command of Allah. Know by your Lord they will not believe until they take you as the final judge in all of their affairs. And they submit to everything you say. And they don't find anything in their hearts problematic to submitting to you. Right? So any person who says... I don't follow the Prophet ﷺ. by unanimous consensus he's not a Muslim, he's literally a Kafir. So your question of are there people who are trying to distinguish, yes they are, these are the progressives. These are not traditional Sunni Muslims or Shi'i Muslims or any Muslims of the traditional mindset. These are those who say, you know what, let's have a secular Islam, let's have Islam that you know tells me how to pray five times a day but not how to do business transactions. They are the ones extrapolating this point and it is because of this that somebody might feel we should cut the door at its roots but that's not the proper way to fight you know, deviation with another deviation. We believe that the Prophet was a mujtahid, that Allah allowed him to do ijtihad and that his ijtihad is binding. That's very clear. Now, these groups are basically saying, because he made ijtihad, why should we follow it? That's what they're trying to say, right? And in response to them, we say we follow it because there are over 60 verses in the Quran that command us to follow the Prophet Wasallam. That's why. Is that clear? So, in, in that case, when the Prophet said not to even pluck a leaf from a tree in the haram, then how do we justify like when you see all this expansion? Well, that I mean, realize Yadanish and all of all of you here, please. This is a Sira class. Don't derive laws from anything I say. The issue of plucking is deeper than this. By unanimous consensus, you may pluck uh, trees that are planted by humans, for example. How else are you going to harvest food, right? Also, by unanimous consensus, the Wali al Amr or the ruler or whatnot has the right to designate property for expansion, for houses, whatnot. The point here is that vegetation and free animals, wild animals, should not be touched for no reason. Okay, so we might have other issues with the expansions taking place, but plucking trees is not one of them. Okay? The plucking of the trees doesn't apply here because the, it, it would not apply when you're plucking it for a greater good. For example, the Prophet ﷺ ordered that the trees of Medina be dug up because he wanted to expand the masjid. Right? So when he came to Medina, you are allowed to pluck those trees to expand the masjid or to build houses or whatnot. How do you think people in Mecca and Medina are going to build houses? They have to. So when there's a, a overwhelming reason to do so, then you will do it. But otherwise, there's a sanctity even on the wildlife of Mecca and Medina. That you don't touch even the wildlife for no reason. Okay? Well, when do you touch wildlife for no reason? Hunting. Hunting. You're not allowed to hunt. In Mecca and Medina, you're not allowed to hunt. So you see gazelles and deers. Once upon a time, there were gazelles and deers outside Mecca and Medina. Right now, of course, not. But once upon a time, there were zebras in Arabia. There were zebras. There are still rabbits and hares in the desert outside Mecca. You're not allowed to go and hunt over there. So the the wildlife is sacred. If you're outside of Mecca, you're just you know walking and 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 you see a tree there. You can't just pluck it out for no reason in the Haram area. 
as long as it's in the Haram area. But if you're building a house, that's a separate issue. Okay.